Support for Digging Deeper comes from the Penn State Alumni Association. Connecting alumni to the university and to each other, the Alumni Association is powered by pride. Learn more at alumni.psu.edu. The Penn State Bookstore, now in an expanded location at the Hub Robeson Center. Improving the student experience at Penn State with philanthropic support for student causes throughout the university. PSECU, a credit union providing financial services to its members throughout Pennsylvania since 1934. More at PSECU.com. And from viewers like you, thank you. wine go from grape to glass? What challenges do local vineyards face? How do Pennsylvania wines differ from wines made in other regions? In this edition of Digging Deeper, Penn State President Eric Barron and guests will talk about uncorking central Pennsylvania's winemaking potential and expanding consumer interest in growing grapes. He's joined by Michaela Centenari, Assistant Professor of Viticulture, and Ryan Elias, Associate Professor of Food Science. I'll be back later on in the show to talk one-on-one -on -one with President Barron about the future of Penn State Extension and opportunities for alternative spring breaks. Now, here's President Barron. Thank you so much for joining me. This is a, a fun topic. So, you know, Ryan, I, I, I thought I would start with you um, and ask about wine in Pennsylvania because my immediate <clears throat> thought would have been, uh, okay, Napa Valley and... Pennsylvania wasn't the place for wine, but is Pennsylvania a place for wine? It certainly is. You know, it's um, uh, the first vineyard in America was actually in Pennsylvania. Really? It was. Um, we have a, a long history of uh, grape production. Uh, I think you'll find today that most of the grape production is juice grape production um, in Erie County, particularly. But um, uh, the wine industry the is a burgeoning wine industry. It's growing. It's grown I think we have twice as many wineries as we did when I came here in 2008 in the state, which is a good sign. So how many is that now? I think it's around 250. 200, 250. 50, 250, wow. wow. Yeah. yeah, it's a big number. Um, I think um, it's, uh, we're in a climate that's different than Napa, obviously, and that uh, lends itself um, to making different types of wines. Um, and uh, the wines that we produce here are quite different than the wines that you'd find in California, but that's okay. So does that mean you see a wine from Pennsylvania, you shouldn't be afraid, instead you should Oh, you should buy it, it immediately. You should <laughs> <laughs> buy it immediately, yes. that's, that's yeah. good. So now, part of this, uh, my understanding is that we say winery, but that may or may not be the same as vineyard. So are, are we producing a lot of wine in Pennsylvania for which we're not growing the grape? Yes, that's that's true, and I can let Michaela talk more about the grape side of things. But uh, we have a shortage of of wine grapes in the state. It's challenging to to grow high quality wine grapes grapes in our climate. So we import them. We import them. We'll, we'll buy juice. We'll buy fruit from um, from out of state or in state, uh, from but from different parts of the state. Um, so if you go to a winery, most wineries, I'd say the majority of wineries in Pennsylvania are not growing the, the grapes on, on site to produce the wines that they, yeah. so, that they sell. So, Michaela, what kind of grapes are we growing? Oh, we're growing a lot of different varieties. I mean, Pennsylvania is a big state. Yeah. So we go from uh, northwest uh, Erie to southeast, and we have uh, what we call uh, European, like Vitis vinifera variety, Chardonnay, Pinot, uh, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, and that are mostly in the uh, southeast, south central PA, but also in Erie. And we have uh, what we call hybrid or uh, um, hybrid varieties. So those are more cold hardy, they're less uh, famous, but you know, they're easy to grow in some area where it's cold uh, and they're also more disease resistant than the, the European. And also we have the native, like Concord, Niagara. Uh huh. Yeah, and so we have. So you mentioned cold and grapes, and yeah. so is this part of the challenge of growing grapes yeah. in, in Pennsylvania? And That's are there big, others? Yeah, cold definitely is a big um, problem. I mean, cold during the winter, but also in the spring for frost. 
Uh, we had uh, two very cold winter two years ago, mm -hmm. and a lot of vines were injured. They have, you know, injury and that also um, we reduce crop production. I mean, of course, and uh, so that was a big problem for growers. Some have to replant different varieties, and uh, and um, and also we have problem with frost. Maybe you have a warm early spring and after it become cold. And, and so they have injured and again, crop losses. And the disease pressure is different here too. Yeah, another problem is disease pressure because it's wet usually. I mean, we have a humid environment during the summer. Uh, we have a lot of rain, not every year, but you know, we can have, and so that uh, is really conducive to disease. Yeah. So what types of diseases do we worry about? Uh, well, I'm not a <laughs> pathologist, but I can tell you the ones that uh, I know, um, mildew type, types of mildew, powdery mildew and downy uh -huh. mildew. Mm -hmm. uh, black rot is a... Um, yeah, black rot is a big, a big one. one. So what is that? Um, That's right, did I just ask you a question? <laughs> I, can, I need a third, I'm not a pathologist, I need but I can, a third uh, guest of pathologist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a fungal disease, uh -huh. and okay. it's, a, it's a big problem for organic growers, you know, uh -huh. they want to grow grapes organically because there is no uh, a fungicide that really works, uh, organic certified uh, fungicide that really mm -hmm. works for black rot. So basically your cluster become a, a kind of raisins, you know, before, uh, like during before the summer, yeah, yeah, like mummies, uh -huh. we call them. So you have uh, disease issues that are related to moisture and you have uh, damage that can be done by cold and the variability of the weather makes uh, makes a tremendous amount of difference. So, how does Penn State help um, grape growers overcome uh, those mm -hmm. issues? We uh, we do that with our research program and also with extension, uh, you know, activities, ed educational activities, and uh, so we have several research projects. Uh, some of them are uh, commercial vineyards, actually, uh, to look at different frost protection strategies or uh, uh, different canopy management practices that can reduce disease pressure or also can uh, improve fruit quality, you know. And, and, uh, and so I work a lot with plant pathologists or, you know, wine uh, people because they're all very related. Hmm. And do you become climate weather savvy here in terms of the predictions and provide warnings? And Yeah, I mean, we are always, you know, uh, during the winter, we are afraid about a cold event. Yeah. In the spring, we are afraid about warm uh, early spring and a cold uh, event. So we are always worried. We are always and, about and rain the rain, at, rain at the before wrong time. harvest. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. And do you, if you have a cold spell, do you lose the vine, actually lose the vine? No, you can, well, you can lose your flower, you know, and... Uh, so and, just uh, no crop. The, the cluster, and then you have to yeah. wait again. So you have to do yeah. everything again. So I think what you're hearing is that the, the real challenge to making wine is growing good fruit. Um, so what makes a good grape? <laughs> well, <laughs> you need to have a certain amount of sugar. Um, because that sugar gets converted to alcohol, and that's sort of the point of the mm -hmm. operation. You need a certain amount of alcohol in the final product to make it stable. You need to have your acid levels in the right range, um, both pH and total acidity. Um, you need to have good flavor. It needs to become ripe in the vineyard at the, cer at the right stage, um, right before harvest. Um, and of course, all these things are so completely dependent on weather and mm -hmm. yeah. climate. Um, so where that is. So we have a very you know, different set of, of challenges in, in growing mm -hmm. grapes. Uh, you know, in warm climates in California, they have almost the opposite problem. They have fruit that accumulates too much sugar, that gets too ripe. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a matter of balance, balancing that with acid. Um, mm -hmm. Here we have plenty of acid and often too little sugar. Hmm. Um, hmm. And you know, I always, I think I remember reading about, you know, an old vine and bringing it in and 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 do we do we think that way in Pennsylvania too about what the heritage is of of the vines or is this a, a different kind of story that I'm talking about here that's just the really expensive wines out there somewhere I'll defer to you <laughs> <laughs> that's a hard question no we are I think we are trying more like new variety that uh -huh. can adapt to our climate right. you know, maybe they're not famous you know they're right. not yeah 
but they can grow well here and they can make good wine. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in addition of the weather, like Ryan was talking, to have good quality fruit is the vineyard manager. I mean, mm -hmm. what he does in the vineyard is so important. And um, yeah, that is the... So we, we have to hear all these different factors and, um, and you mentioned harvest. How do I know when to harvest my grapes? <coughs> Well, it's funny. I, I don't actually have <laughs> any, have any but I'm sort of imagining yeah, it. No, yeah. uh, so what growers or we do, we sample, you know, our fruit and we check sugar, uh, acidity, pH. So those, those are easy measurements. Mm -hmm. uh, but also it's very important about, especially for making wine, the flavor and aroma. Mm -hmm. So, you know, growers or winemakers, they're trained to taste. taste. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, and they, but sometimes we have to compromise. You know, if a storm is coming, rain, and we know that can cause disease, like we call bunch rot, you know, so rot problem. Sometimes we need to harvest. Even or the grower wants to harvest. The winemaker wants to wait, you know. Uh-huh. So it's a balance. It's a balance, yeah. yes. Right. So, but literally this is the chemistry and sampling of sugar content and someone plucking the grape and saying, it's the flavor, yeah, the aroma, right. the flavor is there, yeah. For yeah. the vast majority of wineries, I think uh, the very large wineries would do more advanced chemical analyses of the flavor compounds, the aroma compounds in, in the fruit. But basically you're relying on the winemaker uh, or the vineyard manager, or whoever, to go into the vineyard and smell and taste these things um, and using human sensory perception uh -huh. as, the, as the guiding tool. And then if you're doing, like you were saying with a, a, a larger winemaker and you're, you're sampling all of these different components, is that provide a, a, a guide on what you do next? Uh, certainly, so you know, we typically measure the things that are easy to measure in the uh -huh. vineyard, things like sugar, um, things like acid. Um, if you're looking, you know, you're looking for a specific target sugar content, which would be predictive of final alcohol, you're, you're making decisions based on aroma. If all these things are coming together at, this, at the right time, that is your decision to harvest, balanced with, is there a storm coming? What's the forecast look yeah. like in a week? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, and then am I picturing um, machines going down the vineyards or am I picturing uh, a large group of people with big sacks collecting grapes? Both. 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 But in Pennsylvania, mostly, I mean, in Erie, will be machine, mostly. Mm -hmm. In Erie, they have, you know, big Concord vineyards. That are more for juice than more wine. More for juice, yeah. or they have large size vineyards. Other part of Pennsylvania, mostly we have a small, you know, five, ten acres vineyard. So mm -hmm. mostly it's done by hand. Done by hand because it's uh, just economically, yes. that's the only way to do it. But yes. is there any difference with the product depending on how it's harvested? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, yeah. Yes, I mean, there is some, a lot of research going on to optimize mechanization. So, you know, the quality doesn't um, go down. I mean, it's still there. When you have a human going through, uh, they're able to select certain clusters, um, omit other clusters. Um, they can yes, be more gentle disease, with the fruit. You know, yeah. This one's ready, this one's not. Right. This one this has a, a problem. This exactly. one, yeah. And then, you know, lay them into a, into a bin gently, whereas a, a mechanical harvester going through a vineyard is indiscriminate. It's just pulling everything in. Yeah. And you see a lot of broken uh, mm -hmm. clusters, broken berries. Um, so, Ryan, can I ask you what's next after that? What happens next after... Yeah. You've put the grapes in the bin. Now this is the easy part. To be this honest. is the easy part. <laughs> this is the easy part, and I, it's, uh, I'm embarrassed to admit it as a, <laughs> as a someone that teaches food processing. Wine making is actually one of the easiest, uh, most straightforward uh, food processing operations, I mean, especially yeah. compared to brewing or making dairy products. It's it's pretty simple. Um, mm -hmm. You're basically trying to uh, lock in the quality of the fruit and not mess it up too much. Um, so to answer your question, you'd have fruit that would come into the, to the winery. Um, it would go to a part of the winery called the crush pad, and it would go into a, a machine called a crusher destemmer, which would both crush the fruit and take the stems off. 
And then if you're making white wines, you follow a different path. If you're making red wines, it's a slightly different path. Um, but uh, after this, you're adding yeast. You're, you're waiting a bit. You're sampling and measuring um, the decline in sugar mm -hmm. as it's consumed and the alcohol as it's being produced. And it's easy to measure. Easy to measure, yes. And there's a difference there whether I have a sweet wine or a dry wine by how long I wait? Typically, um, wines that are sweet are, well, you have two options when you're making a sweet wine. You can arrest the fermentation, you can stop the fermentation from going to completion. So you, you preserve some of that sugar, that, uh, mm -hmm. the, sh the grape sugar. Mm -hmm. Your other option is to go to completion, to go to dryness and then add sugar after the fact, mm -hmm. uh, back, back sweetening. Mm -hmm. um, those are your options, and you can so, do it through the reds or with whites. So this is um, th th this seems very interesting to me because here I'm deciding in the process with a grape um, that a, a level of sweetness that I want to have and how I'm developing uh, my wine. But I always used to really appreciate uh, German wine labels. I don't think they're even that way anymore. But they would tell you exactly where you were in the harvest. And where you were in the harvest right. had a great deal to do with how sweet it was as well. Sure, mm -hmm. certainly. Yeah. So, so uh, this is a, a big issue: is is wine labels uh -huh. <laughs> and the lack of information and the lack of uniformity across wine labels. Um, I, I think. Uh, but I have choices: time of harvest, or certainly in the process of fermentation, mm -hmm. to decide so, how yeah. sweet I'm going to let it be, or whether or not sugar has been added to the final product. You know that's common. And you have very um, you have very uh, little information to go on. At least in in our labels, it's hard to really know um, unless it says on the label this is a sweet wine, this is a, a dry wine, this is semi sweet. Um, Otherwise, so, you're just it's it's experimental. It's experimental. Um, yeah. with, with some wines, you you can get a an indication of sweetness um, based on the alcohol. Alcohol concentration um, by volume has to be disclosed on our labels. If it's a low number, it typically means it's a sweet wine. Oh, mm -hmm. I never knew that. Yeah. A useful tidbit there. So um, now I also remember a friend of mine making wine and I thought it was awful. And um, my memory is there was a sulfite taste to it or something like that. What are the common mistakes that, that are are made. Well, can I ask, was this a more of a rotten egg smell or was it like a, a burnt match kind of smell when you say sulfur? Ooh. Uh, I don't know. Just I unpleasant. Don't, I don't, like. yeah, <laughs> just just had kind of an aftertaste to it that was, but I don't yeah. think it was burnt match. Well, I, a very common issue with, with winemaking is, is the production of these sulfurous compounds um, that smell like rotten egg or sewage in some right. cases. Um, they're very easily detected by humans and they result often from uh, poor fermentation management. So a lack of nutrients. Um, I wish available. I had known to complain to the person <laughs> and say, oh, your fermentation <laughs> management <laughs> here is, right, right. leaves something. Well, next so, time. yeah, so, so what's the mistake they're making? Uh, not understanding how much, uh, how much nutrient the yeast needs based on the initial uh -huh. juice chemistry. Um, often, a, a key analysis that winemakers will, will do, especially large winemakers will, will measure the amount of nitrogen that's available to the yeast in the, in the juice. And if it's below a certain threshold, they'll supplement it um, mm. and to prevent this. That's not the only mechanism to get these off flavors, but that's a common one. So, but if you're paying attention to the chemistry and following this kind of a process, do you describe this as hard or easy to make the wine if you're an individual? It's, it's quite easy. I'd say if it's you quite follow easy. The steps, yeah. Yeah. You follow the steps. If you are uh, fastidious, if you're if you're good with sanitation, if you are, um, if you are good about keeping detailed notes, uh, it's a, it's a simple thing to do. The equipment, the investment that you need in terms of equipment, mm -hmm. is minimal. We're mm -hmm. talking about glass carboys or small. Um, inexpensive fermenters, mm -hmm. um, a way to measure the specific gravity of, uh, of the solution to, to measure sugar, mm -hmm. um, and um, a good nose and a good palate, mm -hmm. and uh, that's all you need. Is there a popularity for wines that aren't made with grapes, and do we have such an industry in Pennsylvania as well? 
Yeah, some area of Pennsylvania more than other. Yeah, they. I personally prefer the one you know the made with grapes. grapes. Yeah, <laughs> and from Italy. <laughs> But yeah, in some areas of Pennsylvania, they're popular, you know, fruit, fruit wine, wines, yes. they're called fruit wines, yes. Now, Michaela, if I have this right, you're from Bologna? Bologna? Yes, Bologna, yeah, perfect. Uh, and so compare and contrast wine from your, your home, hometown to Pennsylvania that you're busily working in this industry. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, different, very different reality. And um, the climate is different, the variety are different. But uh, I think, you know, I, I also like Pennsylvania wines. I mm -hmm. mean, I, and I think there is a lot that can be done, you know, and a lot of variety that we can try. And uh, so many different kind of climates and, and soil and um, hybrids, you know, also native variety. You can mm -hmm. make a good wine, a good Concord wine or mm -hmm. <coughs> more European variety. And also I like here in Pennsylvania to work with growers. We didn't do a lot that in Italy, you know, growers, they've been growing grapes forever. Forever, like, and so... So, like, you know, we know... And we know uh, our weather, we know our grapes, yeah, we know we our... we know our variety, you know, know yeah. what variety to grow. Here is more a young industry, you know, they need more guidance, and, um, and I like that. Yeah, and they're very passionate about growing grapes. So I have one last uh, uh, quick question. If someone... Uh, spots the two of you in the wine store, should they follow you around to decide what to buy? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> I think what you'd find if you followed me around is I, I, I look for cheap wines. Uh, it's my, sort of my, my passion is looking for. Good but inexpensive. Yeah, I look for value. Yeah. Um, and actually, I'd say our state store um, no, has a very good selection. Yeah, and I think they true. are one of the largest buyers. Uh, so there's a... Uh, nice volume discount. I think that's passed on to consumers. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next up on Digging Deeper, I'll talk one on one with President Barron about Penn State Extension funding and about the possibility of an academic major in winemaking. President Barron, in a study I saw released in January, it was determined that the United States wine and grape products accounted for over $160 billion for our economy. And agricultural studies have always been and always will be a very important field at Penn State. Is there a time that you see that maybe a winemaking major or brewing major at Penn State is created? So I, I do think it's possible. I, I actually asked our, our two guests um, about path to a major and one of the things they said is there's really a growing set of career opportunities for students in this field that as that particularly in Pennsylvania we have a very young industry and it presents lots and lots of different opportunities and you can get the courses you want embedded in other majors but usually that's a sign that you're on the way to a new major when you have start to have that kind of demand. Penn State Extension Specialists assist grape growers throughout the state. In the last round of budget talks, Penn State's extension program was facing dramatic cuts. In the end, the funding was preserved, but a lot of people are very uneasy about that, specifically employees through extension. How damaging was that to the program? So first of all, there's no way that employee, employees can't be uh, concerned when you go through a budget cycle for which you're eight, nine months into the year and you don't have a budget. And whereas uh, a student paying tuition can expect to have the classes still be taught, that's the major uh, revenue for our budget, if you're an extension agent and the dollars come uh, purely from the state and from grants and contracts, you can't use a tuition dollar to pay for an extension agent, at, at least not comfortably. So it creates a certain amount of risk, but as we saw, uh, Pennsylvania stepped up and, and I think they, they recognize just how important agriculture is. And so they stepped up to make sure that, 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 um, that agriculture was funded. Unfortunately, you do lose the people when, when they're uncertain about their future. So is extension in a better position funding wise going forward or will it still always be vulnerable just based on how it's funded? Well, I, I think that was a unique year in many ways that it took so long, that doesn't happen very often. Um, but, but at the same time, the budget in 
Harrisburg is not great. And so we will see risk um, to, to the university's budget. I do not think in the same way that it was uh, two years ago. So switching gears here a little bit, students at Penn State just returned from spring break and a lot had opportunities to either travel abroad or participate in research through embedded programs at Penn State. So what are your thoughts on these programs? Okay, I think they're absolutely wonderful. Um, th these are students using their spring break and you could imagine them uh, kicking back in Cancun or someplace like that, but instead they've decided to focus on service and uh, they've, they've decided to focus on having uh, an experience outside of the typical U.S. experience. And these are activities that enrich their education and quite frankly will enrich their lives for a long, long time to come. Thank you so much. On behalf of Penn State President Eric Barron, we'd like to thank our guests, Michaela Centenari, Assistant Professor of Viticulture, and Ryan Elias, Associate Professor of Food Science. I'm Kayla Fish, thanks for joining us. Support for Digging Deeper comes from the Penn State Alumni Association, connecting alumni to the university and to each other. The Alumni Association is powered by pride. Learn more at alumni.psu.edu. The Penn State Bookstore, now in an expanded location at the Hub Robeson Center, improving the student experience at Penn State with philanthropic support for student causes throughout the university. PSECU, a credit union providing financial services to its members throughout Pennsylvania since 1934. More at PSECU.com. And from viewers like you, thank you.